dickish piercings. Pros, cons, advantages, disadvantages. Also going to talk about uh, what you should know beforehand, getting the piercing, uh, healing the piercing, jewelry, and living with the piercing. And then if you decide you don't want it anymore, what it's going to involve if you decide to take the jewelry out and abandon the piercing. Coming up next on... Pros and Cons by a Piercer, Season 2, Episode Number 48. So you might want to stick around. For those who are new to the channel, first off, uh, welcome to the channel. I hope you're enjoying the videos here on the Body Piercing and Tattooing channel. But you may not know who I am. My name is Dave O. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. Before I get too far into this, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. I am going to be talking about a male genital piercing. If you're easily offended or do not want to learn about a male genital piercing, or it's uh, not socially acceptable in your part of the world to know such things, you may want to find another video. There are plenty of other videos relating to piercings that have absolutely nothing to do with male genitals or any type of sexual activity um, on this channel that are going to be more than appropriate for you and probably quite enjoyable, I would think. The other thing is, is this is solely for educational purposes. Uh, there's nothing about this video that's going to be stimulating or any of that. So if you're looking for that, you're definitely in the wrong place. Now, let's talk about what exactly a gish is. It's done through the perineum, which is at the base of the scrotum, right there between the anus and the base of the scrotum. Placement can vary from person to person, depending on body type, uh, sensitivity, etc. We'll get a little bit more into that later on. This is usually done with a ring or circular style jewelry. It can be done with straight and uh, curved barbells. Personally, I like to do them with good old-fashioned catty bead rings. They just seem to heal better, and it's less of a hassle for the clientele, less things to fall off, and etc. This will create kind of a flush tunnel, uh, just like a scrotum piercing or a frenum piercing. Uh, it's a service-to-service -service piercing in a way, but at the same time, it's one that's very successful and isn't as prone to rejection as, say, an anti-trachis or a uh, anti-eyebrow or a surface trachis. This piercing tends to heal out, and generally people that have this piercing have it for an extended period of time without any rejection or migration. Now, uh, as far as the history, the history of this piercing is kind of muddled. There's like the myth, and then there's the reality. The myth is was created by probably the, one of the most important persons when it comes to body piercing and the early development, uh, Richard Simpleton, also known as Doug uh, Malloy. Uh, he created the myth that this was done by indigenous people of Tahiti as a rite of passage. There is absolutely no documentation to this. Uh, if you watched my old pros and cons from season one, I actually state that, that they used to put like uh, animal skins in it. There's no documentation to that effect. However, it was a common piercing in, probably in the late 70s was when it was developed in the gay BDSM uh, subculture. A lot of people uh, associated with that. It didn't really reach popularity or was introduced through modern piercing to the general public, probably the late 80s, early 90s. Now let's get into one of the reasons why you come here, the pros, the advantages, the things that make you say, yeah, sure, I'll try that one out, and that's going to be great. Number one does not interrupt uh, intercourse as much as other male genital piercings do. If you kind of think about the location of this piercing, it's not going to affect things as much as, say, a frenum would or a uh, Prince Albert piercing or anything that's done further up on the shaft of the penis. Number two has an extremely long history of healing without issue or problem. This is a piercing that definitely has a, its little problems here and there, but for the most part is a pretty easy heal and isn't really prone to a lot of issues. Number three, increases sexual uh, stimulation. Uh, generally, if it's pulled on or there's pressure applied to it, it seems, it seems to kind of stimulate people. Now, like anything with genital piercings, if your uh, sex life is not great or what have you, this isn't going to magically make it 100% better. It varies from person to person. What I always tell people is it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different. might be better. might be worse, but it'll definitely be different. 
but this is a common piercing for uh, the weight of it and kind of having that extra stimulation in the area. Number four can be done in groupings. Uh, these can be done as a uh, continuation of a scrotum ladder, um, or they can be done in just just as a ladder themselves. Depending on the anatomy of the person getting it done, sometimes you can do up to three or four of these comfortably without issues, um, and then maybe continue to a scrotum ladder and then up to a frenum ladder or Jacob's ladder. So there's a there's a lot of room in there on some people, not everybody, some people where it can go a little further up and a little bit more interesting. And number five. This piercing is easy to hide. Like old genital piercings, unless you're intimately involved with the person or you tell them or show them for whatever reason, uh, nobody needs to know you have this. So if you are in a conservative line of work, have a conservative career, or you live in a conservative part of the world, this might be a good choice for you because no one's going to see it. No, before we move on to the cons, uh, if you like this, please like it, as in thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you're notified every single time we post something. If you have this piercing or you have questions about this piercing, feel free to comment. I generally try to answer them when I have time. Uh, And uh, a lot of times, people from the community will jump in and help you out if I can't get to it in time. But, yeah, go ahead and comment. It helps us out and also helps you be part of the community. Now let's move on to the cons and disadvantages, the things that make you go, no, uh uh-uh, not for me. Things most people don't like, except those that don't like this piercing. So anyway, number one, location, hygiene, and walking and other activities. Basically, because of where it's located at, you have to be very careful that you do not contaminate the piercing area, especially during the healing process when you are defecating. Uh, When you are cleaning up afterwards, you definitely need to wipe front to back. And for a lot of men, that is not something they really are that concerned about normally. So it's really kind of a little bit of a change of habit. Even after the piercing is healed, uh, there's always a possibility of a slight tear in the piercing or what have you, and then you're going to have do it the wrong way, and then you have an infection. So practice hygiene. The other issue with this part of the anatomy is this kind of collecting point. Um, we all know this as men or those that are uh, have this type of genitalia that pretty much everything kind of collects right there. Um, So you do need to get a little bit more diligent about keeping the area clean on a regular basis. Nothing really crazy, but it is something you need to consider. Then we move on to activities like walking. Uh, Generally, we try to position this up high enough that it isn't affected by where the thighs come in contact with the area. However, it can affect sitting on certain things, especially anything that is raised up. But if you really think about where and how you sit, a majority of the time it isn't in that area that's actually having contact with whatever you're sitting on. Mainly what you want to be concerned with is things like uh, amusement amusement park rides, where it's kind of like a cheap hotel, they're releasing any ballroom. Those where it's directly in contact and there's pressure on it and et cetera could damage this piercing even after it heals. So it's one thing you do need to consider. There's certain activities um, and consider that before you get it done and avoid it afterwards. Number two, uh, I often refer to this as one of the most uncomfortable ways to get pierced. Uh, because of the positioning that we have to put you in, when we do this piercing, which is on all fours with your head down, uh, it's kind of you kind of feel vulnerable, I'm guessing, and kind of open to the air, so to speak. Uh, it cannot be a very pleasant experience for the piercer sometimes, depending on your hygiene level, but it is probably one of the one of those. And it's the only piercing we do in that position. So there you go. It's unique in that way. Now that moves us on to number three. Number three is more acceptable to STDs. Like any other oral piercing, it is hard metal through soft tissue. Uh, Just basically during the strenuous activities that are usually involved with sexual activity, there's a possibility of causing slight tears in this. And then you have a open wound, which could lead to an increased chance for contracting STDs uh, during various different sexual activities. So... Basically, what I mean is when you, if you have this piercing and you switch partners, you have to practice safe sex. Number five, can hydrate out of alignment. Sometimes just basically from how you walk, how you activities you do, et cetera. 
Maybe you, you put a little too much pressure on this piercing. It can migrate a little bit out of alignment one way or another. Rejection, if the gauge is thick enough, is pretty rare, but it is always a possibility, including tearing. So, and I'll get into stretching here in a little bit. Uh, but it, it, it kind of comes down to you do have to have a little bit of a leeway. You can't be one of those people where it's not perfectly straight anymore, and I have problems with it. It may move. It's, your body's going to kind of push this to where it wants to be. Now, let's talk about merch. If you like T-shirts, you like swag, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. Now, we move on to things you should know before getting the piercing done um, or check out. The first thing and foremost is you need a piercer that is professional, um, personable, uh, experience with this piercing, informative, and makes you feel comfortable. Because as I said earlier, you're going to be in a weird position that you're not in very often, or maybe you are, but definitely not in a situation where someone's coming towards you with a sharp object. So it really has to be somebody that is professional and knows what they're doing. They should have done a number of these piercings. Uh, it is not one of the more difficult piercings to do, but placement is extremely important to your uh, comfort of life afterwards. So you really do need to find somebody that knows what they're doing. Usually with the jewelry on this one, you're kind of limited to a few. Uh, it should be a ring, preferably captive ring. I don't suggest hinge rings or seamless rings in this area because it's kind of hard to, hard to monitor where those hinges and connections are or the seam is. Um, circular barbells are another good option or curved barbells. I have had clients that have worn stray barbells in this, and because the piercing kind of does a surface type type loop of a uh, flush tunnel, so to speak. I They can work, but sometimes having that next or little curvature into the body helps it heal a little bit easier. Now, the next thing is, is it may bleed for up to, off and on for up to five days. Uh, so you do need to make precautions for that and be ready for that. The next thing is cross-contamination prevention. Things like um, the oral contact or exchange of bodily fluids, keeping your environment clean, clothing, bedding, towels, not submerging the piercing in bodies of water you can't control the quality of. Keep your pets out of the bed. Don't let them sleep in there. They're just germ magnets. Germ magnets, I tell you. Also, uh, sexual activity, you're probably going to want to practice safe sex for a minimum of six months just to be on the safe side. And, of course, hygiene and front to back. I already said it once, twice, maybe five times, but front to back. Another thing you want to know beforehand is whether or not your piercer supplies aftercare products. And uh, this should be covered in the consultation. And a lot of what I just went through should be covered in the consultation. Uh, piercers should willingly give you a consultation, go through what the average chilling time, which on this one can be anywhere from six to nine months. Um, they should go through what it's going to take to heal it in cross-contamination prevention beforehand. They should also possibly check your anatomy to make sure you're acceptable for this piercing. Now let's move on to the piercing experience. Uh, usually, consultation covers most of what I just talked about, concerns, etc. Gives you that opportunity to have your anatomy uh, evaluated to see whether or not it's going to work, and also gives you an opportunity to ask your piercer questions that you may have that haven't been answered by this video, if that's possible. Next up, you sign a waiver. Um, waivers usually are more, they're about liability, but they're also a questionnaire that's going to cover health issues, medication, intoxicants, or intoxication, and allergies. So it's important you do read the waiver and check that off accordingly. Next up, set up, uh, they will set up their, uh, their piercing area to, to do the piercing with all their equipment that's going to be needed, and they will then disinfect the area. Now, you'll probably be asked to disrobe, and you may be asked to get on all four so they can mark it properly. At the time of marking or before the time of marking or during the consultation, and I usually suggest that people remind the, per the piercer during the marking, talk to them about whether or not you plan on doing groupings or if that's a possibility. The other thing you need to talk to them about is whether or not you plan on stretching this piercing. This piercing is notorious for people stretching them out to large gauge uh, jewelry. They generally, that weight kind of feels better there and other things. So making sure that that placement is going to be anchored enough is important to whether or not you're going to be able to stretch it in the future. Once the marking is done, uh, I have the client stand up, uh, pay attention to where the marks are, and have them raise one leg or the other so I have an idea or both. 
to have an idea that it's not going to interrupt walking and cause that twisting back and forth during the healing process and afterwards. We want to make sure that we want to have that sweet spot that feels best, and that varies from male to male or person to person. But we also want it high enough that it's not going to interrupt and cause a lot of issues with walking, sitting, et cetera. Yeah, next the client gets back on all fours. We clamp it with a set of Pennington forceps to flatten out the tissue. Uh, the needle is injected in and through. Then the forceps are removed. Now, on jewelry insertion, if it's threaded jewelry, they'll probably use a taper pin with the threaded jewelry attached to it, and it's one fluid motion. If they're using cat bead rings or something that doesn't have a guide pin, that's acceptable for it, which is pretty much only rings. They will blunt uh, force it, meaning they will press that jewelry against the uh, needle and then slowly insert it while having pressure on the needle in one motion. Then they'll close up the jewelry, whether it's screwing on an end or it's popping that ball into place, and piercing is done. Now, there might be a little bit of slight bleeding that needs to be stopped. Um, they're usually right afterwards, you might have a little bit of throbbing, aching. Usually with general piercings, it's kind of an, oh, God, that hurts, and then it's over. Unlike other piercings where you'll have that throbbing and aching for a long period of time, usually with genital piercings, it's kind of an, ow, and then unless you bump it, you don't really notice it. Piercing will be sensitive to the touch. As I mentioned, if you bump it, you're going to know it. Try to isolate it or uh, protect it as much as you possibly can. Now let's talk about healing. Average healing time on this could be six to nine months. Uh, sometimes people heal out about three, but generally it's 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 a, it's a little bit longer than other piercings in the genitals. Uh, you want to clean twice daily using a sterile saline. I, I like Melma, Nelmed's piercing aftercare that comes out of that fine mist. It seems to be the easiest to use. You might see some swelling in the first three to five days. It's normal. You might also see some bleeding. Of course, you need to practice cross-contamination prevention. Um, it avoiding contact or stress on the jewelry or the piercing. Avoid playing with the piercing. Keep your partners away from it um, in excessive movement in the area. It's a good idea that when you're getting something like this done, a genital piercing, that you do it like if you have a three-day weekend, like we just had here Memorial Day weekend, do it on Friday so you have those couple days to just kind of relax and not have to deal with anything. Now, a sanitary napkin or pad can be helpful for three main reasons. I held up four fingers. I meant three. First one being is if it bleeds, it can cut down the likelihood of staining clothing. The second one being is that it cuts down the amount of moisture in the area, which also counts down on the amount of bacteria, and that's just one more way your body does not have to work towards fighting off an infection. Lastly, um, it's going to add a little bit of cushioning during that initial tender phase and when you're getting used to having it. So it might save you from bumping it a few more times and it might help keep it more in place. Of course, avoid trauma and contact with the piercing. Now let's move on to jewelry. Uh, the jewelry should be left in at all times or is absolutely, uh, with any piercing, I, your best option is always to leave the jewelry in. If you're using threaded jewelry, like a circular barbell, a curved barbell, or a straight barbell, you do want to check the balls on a regular basis. It is my experience when it comes to threaded jewelry and genital piercings that they fall off as soon as you sit on the toilet. That's when you notice the jewelry's loose, then it's in the toilet, never to be put back in your body again. So check them on a regular basis. Uh, usually setting up kind of a weekly program like Monday is my day to check my balls is a good idea. Check those ends. Make sure they're tight. The ends should be simple. Don't get anything that has any sharp edges, points, or anything that's dangling off of it that's just asking to get caught on clothing and cause issues. Now, once it's completely healed and seasoned, you can add weights to this. Also, you can possibly stretch the piercing. This is one of those piercings that from I don't personally have, but from most of the clients I've talked to, they've said thicker gauges and having a little extra weight there feels good. So you really just want to give your body time to strengthen and season that piercing to the point where it's easy. Uh, it's not going to cause damage to the piercing. Don't go for the weights and the heavy jewelry right off the bat, but it is a possibility. Um, you can look into that, and that might be something that your goals are going to be, is looking for that perfect weight or perfect thickness. If you have a medical issue that's going to require you removing old metal jewelry, even though it's titanium or uh, implant-grade jewelry, most places will not let you wear it into surgery. 
Glass jewelry or glass retainers is a good option. You can wear it in the piercing, uh, usually for a long period of time without issues. Now it's time to move on to living with the piercing. Of course, threaded jewelry should be checked at least weekly. Uh, continue to avoid stress, uh, contact, et cetera. Even in a heel piercing, if you put enough pressure on it and et cetera, it can cause damage, especially blunt or really strong like pulls, et cetera. Uh, so be cautious of it. Understand that if you like that, you're going to thicker gauge is going to make that a little more comfortable and less likely to cause damage. So you might want to consider stretching the piercing if that's something you really enjoy. And once again, leave the jewelry in at all times. There's absolutely no reason to take the jewelry out and clean it or any of that other nonsense. Leave jewelry in. It's your best option. Now we're going to talk about something that's a little bit off the beaten path, chastity and and fibrillation. I... This piercing, along with the Prince Albert piercing, have been used in combination as a form of chastity play in the BDMSM, BDSM subcultures. Um, I know it's possibly going to come up in comments, so I might as well cover it now and just get it over with. I don't advise this for long term. Basically, what they do is they take the two of them and connect them together. For those that don't know what a Prince Albert piercing is, it's on the... Uh, underside of the penis through the urethra and out the bottom so it, it and usually has a ring so they'll interlock the two rings problem with this is is uh, as a uh, male uh, oftentimes we can't control when we get excited and that pressure in both directions on those two piercings through soft tissue can cause migration rejection damage, et cetera. If you're going to do this type of thing, it really needs to be kind of a, a short-term thing, but not something you want to do for weeks on end and should not even probably even be attempted until you've stretched those piercings up to fairly large, thick jewelry that isn't going to easily just cut through that tissue like a cheese cutter. Now let's talk a little bit about abandoning the piercing. Um, if you have the piercing and it is showing signs of infection or other problem and you've just decided you've had enough of it, it's always advisable that you go see your physician or your piercer and have them check it out before removing the jewelry. The main issue is how your body heals infections and what happens when you remove that jewelry. Your body heals infections by pushing infected tissue and fluids out through the wound once it's isolated and then... Uh, when you remove that jewelry, what can happen is those two holes seal shut, traps that infected tissue and fluids inside your body, leading to either an abscess or a cyst. So it's always advisable if there is issues to have somebody professional or somebody that knows what they're talking about, take a look at it before you take the jewelry out. If it is healthy and it's still healing, removing the jewelry is not going to cause any problems whatsoever. It'll just eventually close. Same thing is if you've healed the piercing out and you've had it for a long period of time and you take the jewelry out, your body will probably more than likely reconnect the tissue and close it. If it's been stretched out to a very large gauge, chances are it may never close completely. It's just part of uh, part of the, the whole piercing wonderment. Only other thing I need to talk about on this subject is sebums. Uh, sebums, a waxy cottage or not cottage cheese, cream cheese-like substance has a very distinct bum-like odor, odor to it. Uh, it's what collects in your navel when you don't clean it. Is sometimes it'll you'll squeeze an abandoned piercing and it'll come out, and a lot of people think it's infected. That is not a sign of infection. Uh, that just means it's uh, producing that oil inside the piercing, which is really common. Don't worry about it. Perfectly normal. Soap and water. You'll be fine. Well, that's all I have to say today about Gish piercings. Till next time, here's hoping all your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you in the next video.